How can I improve my art? That's what I get asked the most on Twitter and various platforms. And uh, I thought, why not make a video on it? So I put the call out on YouTube saying, you want me to improve your art? Send me your blend file and I'll do my best. So this is a new video format that I'm trying. You can let me know in the comments if you like it. Um, but anyways, in this video, I'm gonna be focusing on this teddy bear render and improving it. I intended to actually work on the original dot blend, but as you'll see, I realized it was actually gonna be much faster just to remake it from scratch. And I'll be going through each step, so this is also a tutorial. If you care to follow along, you're welcome to. Anyway, let's begin. To me, the most glaring uh, issues that I see with this is the mesh itself, the underlying foundation that everything else is built on. So if it's wrong, then you're kind of like shooting yourself in the foot before you even get anywhere, right? So um, I can see that you you started with like sort of like primitive shapes and you tried to sort of create the body for it, um, which I used to do as well. And I know you, you know, created them and sort of plopped spheres on where the, the limbs are because you weren't really sure how to join them. Um, and I can relate to that. <laughs> 3D is kind of confusing like that. It's like, how do you how do you make that work? So the method you've tried to do is like poly modeling, right? Um, which is, yeah, you start with primitive shapes then you add edge loops, you extrude things. But then, yeah, you've got to like, you know, try and figure out how to create like more detail where none exists and then join that more detail with the lesser detail. And it creates this, it becomes a puzzle. It honestly, it's like not, you spend 90% of the time just figuring out how to join the dots and create an edge loop where it should go. And you forget often that this also needs to look good. So I would actually not suggest that. The method that I would suggest is sculpting, um, which previously was a pain in Blender. Um, I wasn't a fan of it, but 2.81 has made a number of improvements. The biggest one in my eyes is that now there's a little cursor which will actually sit like on the angle of the, the face that you're about to draw on, which is so helpful. It's something that ZBrush always had blended in. Now it does, and I actually love it now. It's a lot of fun. So I would suggest sculpting. Now before I start, I would also say the number one thing that beginners can do that will just immediately make their work way better is to start with a reference photo. Um, it doesn't really matter what reference photo, but you gotta start with one and then go, I'm gonna make that. So you put that into the background, add in a sphere, and this isn't a sculpting tutorial, but the whole point of this method is so you don't have to think about topology. So you wanna use dynamic topology, which will create detail where it's needed. Um, and then you just use the snake hook tool to drag out the basic shape of the mesh. And uh, it's great. It's just so creative to work this way. And then you just you know use the inflate brush to make the body. Um, you drag it out for the arms and stuff. Side note, any time you're making a character, don't model it with like the arms down by its side because you won't be able to get into the like underneath the armpits. Um, so model it in the T pose or the star pose in this case, and that'll definitely help you later on. But anyways, it doesn't take long, about two to five minutes, I guess. I mean, I have technically sculpted this about 10 times for this tutorial, uh, but anyways, it doesn't take that long. Um, and then once you've finished with it, you should have nice mesh that has horrible topology. <laughs> Now you could technically render it as it is, um, but we want to add image textures to it, which means we have to UV unwrap it and UV unwrapping a mesh like this just really isn't possible. So we do need to do some sort of retopology and make that mesh data something that we can actually use. So there is uh, add-ons like Retopo Flow by CG Cookie um, or 3D Coat. You can go like really advanced into like making a beautiful mesh that's, you know, you can rig it and animate and all that kind of thing. And they do that for like movies and stuff. But in our case, we don't need to make like a really polished looking thing. We just need something that we can UV unwrap and then like basic pose for a static render. So uh, thankfully, Blender 2.81 actually comes with uh, remeshing tools. So uh, if you go into the that tab, whatever that's called, can't remember, uh, but you'll see something there that says remesh. And there is two options. There is voxel and then quadraflow. So uh, voxel will basically create like a, almost like a grid shape over the top of the mesh. Um, and then you, you choose like the size of the grid and then you hit go and it'll just basically make like faces, like even shaped faces across the whole mesh. And um, it works. In this case, it actually works well for this one. The quad, quad, bleh, quad reflow um, will actually try to read the shape of it and create like the flow of the mesh, try and like make 
the topology, I, I didn't really find it to be that good, to be honest. It kind of made those like squiggly edge loops that sort of like spiral around itself. I hate that. So um, we're gonna use voxel, which will work fine in this case. So I went with 0 0.05. For whatever reason, preserve volume will create It'll not preserve the volume, it'll just do the opposite. So I turn that off. But uh, anyways, you end up with this, yay. So uh, we're gonna be using an image texture and I'll explain why later. Um, but obviously to use an image texture, we need to first UV unwrap it, which means we need to place seams. Um, now, obviously wherever you place a seam, there is going to be a visible cut in the fabric. Um, but teddy bears have seams. They're knitted together, right? So rather than being a hindrance, seams can actually work in our favor to help make the teddy look more realistic. So I just place seams down the middle and then wherever there's like limbs, um, ears, neck, that kind of thing. Um, and a pro tip, I discovered this embarrassingly late <laughs> in my blender career, um, but rather than like individually clicking on edges or vertices, um, if you just, control click, um, it will find the shortest path to your selection, which is amazing. It makes UV unwrapping something like this so much easier because um, it's just one less thing to think about. It's just click, 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 and you're done. So with the seams placed, just hit U, unwrap, and then you should get something like this. Now in your render, you used a procedural noise texture for the texture of the fabric. And um, it gets the point across, like you can definitely tell looking at it that it's supposed to be fabric. But again, at this range, it would behoove us to have some more fidelity in that texture. So I'm gonna be using an image texture, this one here from Polygon, um, doesn't have to be Polygon, um, but I recommend it not only because you'll be helping the channel because it's my site, uh, but also because I know that this texture is actually hand model. It's created digitally, which after extensive testing, uh, we discovered that every fabric texture should be made digitally because a photographed fabric, like it's interesting, but like the, the thread, like uh, the, the, the weaves or whatever, it's almost impossible to get it to line up left to right. So even if it's made seamless, it'll never actually be seamless. You'll always get some sort of tiling effect. So never use a photographed fabric texture. Make sure that it is digitally. So this one here is digital and we actually only need the displacement map. So go ahead, download that, bring that into Blender, um, set it to non-colored data because it's not being used in the color ramp. We wanna feed that through a displacement node and then feed that into the displacement input. And this will give us some fake bump. Change the scale however you would normally. Um, if any of the UV islands are like rotated the wrong way, you can rotate them. Uh, the color of the teddy bear is then just defined by whatever color you put into the color input. And unless you want a shiny teddy, I'd also suggest turning the roughness up to something around 0 0.8, 0 0.9, something like that. Now, this looks good but it is fake bump and uh, we wanna, well, I want to make a teddy which is like super high res, like deliciously photorealistic. Um, so I want to actually make this have real displacement, meaning that it will actually, for each of those little fabric weaves, it'll actually like extrude the mesh out slightly. Like it'll, and it'll just, it'll make the, 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 the fabric kind of pop and it'll feel a lot more real. It will increase render times though. So this would only really be applicable for like a VFX shot where it needs to be 100% photo real. But anyways, to do that, uh, we go into the material settings and then where it says bump only for displacement, you wanna change that to displacement and bump. Then you need to add a subsurf modifier um, so that it's got more geometry that it can actually extrude it out. Um, so I add that, set it to level three. And this is where it really increases the render time. So, you know, don't go too high, but something around level three and it'll look pretty good. Now, the teddy bear looks pretty cool, but there is something that's bothering me. And that's that wherever there is a seam, it's basically like a hard cut in the texture. Whereas a real seam, like a real knitted, piece of fabric, it's like indented, right? Um, and I discovered a really cool, easy way that you can actually achieve this in Blender. So what you do is uh, go into edit mode and then use edge selection mode and then just select any part of a seam. Then go select, select similar and select seam. And this will select all of the seams in the mesh. Then you change it to vertex paint mode and then click that little vertex button there and that'll basically just mask it to the selected vertices that we had. Then if you change the paintbrush to black, then, so many steps, hit shift K 
okay, it will then fill those vertices with the black color. So we now have completely white, but with black areas wherever there is a seam. So we can now use that in our material uh, by adding an attribute node and then typing the name of the vertex group, which you can find in the object data panel. So just, you can rename it there and then put it in the attribute. Uh, then you combine that with your displacement color map. So like before, before it gets put into the displacement map, you put it in there with a mix RGB node set to multiply. Then we wanna tighten that seam. We wanna make it look tighter than it is currently. So we wanna add a color ramp node and then basically just bring that white slider all the way back to really crush that black line and make it really, really ultra thin. And then finally, if we combine this with the color input with a mix RGB node, um, it'll fake some like AO, ambient occlusion, and make it look like there's like a kind of a small shadow in there. So this is a really simple, subtle thing that'll like really make the seams feel real. And it'll just like elevate your, your teddy bear to actually something that looks like pretty cool. You didn't have to do any sculpting to achieve it. Now it's time to pose this Teddy because uh, we modeled him in the star shape pose, but it's not gonna look very good for a render. So I'm gonna put him against the wall. Now you could, there's two ways. You could like rig him, the long method, uh, or you could do it in edit mode. But the problem with like moving arms and stuff in edit mode is like the, all the connecting joints just becomes a nightmare. Um, but there is a new brush in Blender 2.81 um, called the pose brush, which I thought was a gimmick. Like when it came out, I was like, mm -hmm, who's gonna use that? Um, but it does a really good job. Like around all the connecting areas, like it's pretty, honestly, it's pretty comparable to like a full rig. It just does a really nice job at like preserving joints and moving arms and limbs and things. It's pretty brilliant. And if there's any area you can't get to, you just like mask it out and it's really good. So um, that's the method that I would suggest. Whilst we're in sculpt mode, now's also a good time to turn off a symmetry and add some differences between the left and the right side because no teddy on earth is this symmetrical. So there's gonna be parts in a real teddy that's like more stuffing in this ear or like like his head's gonna be lopsided. So you wanna add those little differences. You could also add in like some little folds and the creases in the arms. We've got some brushes on Polygon for that kind of thing if you were interested, but you don't really need them. You can just sort of sculpt it yourself. Um, look at reference and just try to copy any little folds and things you can find. And then since we're pretty far along here, we can talk about composition and lighting, right? So in yours, you had it against a dark background. Um, and having tried it myself, it's okay, but I sort of realized it, it makes it look a little scary, like a little too serious for a teddy bear. Maybe for like a horror teddy bear, a scary one. Um, but to make it look friendly, I thought a sort of nice bright scene would work better. So put him against a wall, like the simplest scene I can imagine, against a wall with a little floor trim um, and then a floor, wooden floor, and that's it. Um, and then I just use like an area lamp off to the side, really large to sort of imitate uh, a window. And that was it. Now that he's posed, good chance to uh, add a face. So I just stole like parts of the mesh and made it a nose and made it black. Um, for the eyes, it was just like squashed spheres that are made shiny. Um, and then for uh, the mouth. So in all the reference, it's like, it's usually like made of yarn. Like it's just sort of like knitted. And um, I tried it first just using like a curve, curve uh, with like some thickness to it, but it always just looked really fake. And then I realized like in all the reference, it's it like yarn isn't, just like a constant tube, it's knitted, which means that like it's twisted, right? So what that means is it makes like a squiggly line. So to create that, I just had like three circles um, and then I put that through a screw modifier and then put after that a curve modifier and um, you increase the iterations to fill the length of it. And then it creates like the look of yarn, really simple and um, it got the job done. And uh, I use that for the mouth and also the eyebrows. Um, I noticed in a lot of uh, images, like some teddy bears that had eyebrows, just gave it a little bit more expression. And I thought that was kind of cool. So now we have this and he looks pretty good, but he looks noticeably hard. He looks like he's filled with concrete. Um, so. There are two things that can really uh, make him feel soft and friendly and lovable. And the first one is subsurface scattering. Uh, so we all know that like, you know, skin and milk allows light to pass through it, uh, but so does fabric. It doesn't need a lot, but just a tiny little bit of subsurface uh, will really help this feel soft. Uh, and the second thing is uh, fur. 
There is no fabric on earth probably that isn't surrounded by a layer of fuzz, tiny little bits of stray hairs and fibers. And uh, that really helps to sell the believability. So I set the, uh, the hair length to zero and then I just use brownium, which just gives it like squiggly shapes, which seems to match what fur does on teddies. Um, and then for the, the, the shader, I just use the principled hair shader set to the same color as the teddy. And would you look at that, we finished the perfect teddy. Maybe, I don't know, according to me, it's the best I could do. <laughs> so if you wanna download this, maybe you wanna try and improve it yourself. The download link is in the description. Now, if you're at this beginner stage and you're feeling a little bit disheartened at how much there is to learn, I wanna remind you that I have 15 years experience with Blender. So if you're just starting, it would be illogical to think that you could immediately achieve results like this off the bat. There's so much time in here that you just don't see. And I'm guilty of this myself. When I'm browsing ArtStation, it can feel disheartening to look at where you you want to be and where you currently are and not knowing how to get there. And, and just, you have to remind yourself that there is just often decades of experience between where you are and where that professional that you're looking at is. So don't let that dishearten you, right? There, it's it's a journey. It'll, it'll just take time to learn and just familiarize yourself with it. They went through the exact same beginner style process as you are now. Um, what matters is, is just, uh, being consistent in your practice and knowing that you can get there with uh, with efficient practice. How many buzzwords can I throw at you? Anyways, I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. If you'd like to see more of these improving your art videos, let me know in the comments. Uh, or if you just prefer a normal tutorial, let me know as well. And subscribe to see more videos like this. See you in the next one.